So, um, welcome from Keely and myself. Um, uh, I just thought we'd go through a quickly and explain sort of who we are and what we do. Um, and I'm probably going to have then Keely talk quite a lot because she's the very um, skilled person who knows everything there is to know about uh, schools, but um, I'll try to assist her as well. Um, my name's Heidi, I'm the operations manager. I've worked for Social Farms and Gardens for 13 years now, um, doing various things. At the moment, my role involves uh, really covering things across the UK. Um, we've been involved, I've been involved with quite a lot of training. And at the moment, um, We've been doing quite a lot of online training uh, um, and between Keely and myself we've been doing quite a lot of training with teachers. Um, so we've been running a course called the Growing Teachers course which we'll tell you a little bit about at the end just so you get a flavor of what that's about. Um, and the other thing I guess to say about myself is that uh, for 12 years I was a governor at a primary school and then I also became the chair of trustees for a multi-academy trust. So I have a reasonable knowledge about schools, but I have not worked in schools. I just sort of understand the systems and things behind them. Um, and Keely and I worked together for about five years in Coventry. Um, so we have worked together quite a bit. Um, and now Keely's off doing exciting things at Glover's Peace, which she can tell you a little bit about. So over to you, Keely. <laughs> right, yes. So, <laughs> um, I was an English teacher originally and um, yeah, I started on the same day as Heidi back 13 years ago, <laughs> Social Farms and Gardens as was. Um, and I was the Growing Schools Coordinator there. So my job was entirely um, doing anything that schools needed to get them to garden and to farm um, uh, with no excuses. So we would, I would go in and um, uh, plan with them, build infrastructure, put up polytunnels, build raised beds, train staff, work with children, anything, fundraise the lot. Um, and that ran for five years, um, uh, way beyond the initial funding for of, of three years there. Um, and, uh, and lots of those schools are still doing it. So we set up over 100 different, very different projects. Um, and, and then I moved on to be head of land-based science and farm manager at one of those schools that was a secondary school with a farm and gardens, um, Cardinal Wiseman in Coventry, uh, and ran that for a good few years as well. Um, and uh, ultimately I've ended up at um, Glover's Peace, um, which is a care farm that started a primary school on site. So it's done it the other way around to most schools. Um, uh, and it also has a college um, and um, uh, it's an animal sanctuary type farm. Um, and I'm there as assistant CEO, sort of secondary commander, and I'm still teaching land based. Um, and but mostly it's sort of managing the farm. Um, and um, we have other schools visit as well to do outdoor provision um, and the school on site use it um, as much as they want to as well. Um, so that's sort of where I am. So sort of with um, a, a sort of permaculture, organic farming and ethical farming background too. So that's me. Great. Okay, I'm gonna um, just scroll through and you tell me when you want me to move things along. <laughs> Super, thank you. Right, please move along working with school. <laughs> yeah, yep, here we are. Right, so I have been really, um, I'm not sure at what point, obviously, all of you are thinking of, are you working with schools already or thinking of that, but sometimes you'll get a really clear remit from the school you're working with. I've been very, very lucky to have people with a, a very clear vision of what they want. They want a wildlife garden or they want some raised beds or it's very specific or they come with a sort of vague, uh, broader remit. They know what their aims are and what they need to address, uh, but they don't quite know how to do it, but they think that uh, gardening or farming or so on would um, would address those issues uh, and they ask us to explore that with them um, uh, and we all know that we can um, and I'm sure you do too that it's uh, we can achieve so much through, through gardening and so on and growing um, that it's very very easy to, to fulfill lots of different aims and objectives um, for schools through that. Sometimes they don't know it till you tell them though. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, so that was grown with schools and we gave them absolutely no excuse at all. So if there were any issues, um, we solved it. 
So, um, you know, if there was nobody there to water during the holidays, we set up automatic watering systems. Um, if they really wanted to coordinate the volunteers, we help them and train them um, and, and put them in touch with, with resources to do that too. Um, so we did absolutely everything. And we had everything from um, a school with absolutely no grounds whatsoever who did a roof garden um, right through to working with obviously a, a almost full-scale farm there as well and everything in between. Next one please. So we did make it really simple for ourselves and I'll show you some of the ideas in, in slides coming up. Um, so the ideal school garden can do any or all of these things so they can utilize wasted areas so they might have land that they're not using spaces that need um, beautifying um, it's uh, but we try to make sure that the traffic through that is easily managed so I did a lot of putting some fences up uh, I learned a lot about that during the during the time there as well just to control who's there and what those activities are going on in there treating it like another learning space that can, should be managed um everything in one place for ease of sort of supervision there so making sure that you can see those children at all times um they're all um easily spotted and that if you send one over to get the water and one over to get the tools and one to get the compost you can see the water uh, and, and doing it that way as well working with staff that way um ideally through nearer water or electricity supply or making sure that water catchment is is um doable there as well not always and we've done some pretty remote ones too but that's always a nice thing to have um but it's got good sunlight of course although we have as well in some pretty shady gardens um, that sounds a bit odd but yes you know what I mean protected cultivation as well is a great thing so it extends the growing year right through we're sort of I'll talk a little bit um further on about term time growing and manipulating growing um uh, seasons and so on to fit within the school year um, and protected cultivation polytops and greenhouses and things really really helps and also gives somewhere to learn, work with small groups of children when it's raining um, and we so we advocated that a lot and we did a lot of raised beds too because they work for children um, there's so many benefits um, associated with those in a school environment too next slide please so that was sort of our, our bog standard issue, really. So we built that one um, at a primary school. Um, polytunnel with raised beds either side in there. Uh, we had um, the raised beds around it. It had an automatic water system. We had a, a mini orchard along the side of the fence, and then they extended further down. Um, and they got more creative as we went out towards the playing field. So we had a mandala bed and we had um, sort of wildlife areas um, and I think they invested in chickens as well at some point uh, and extended it but they started small started manageable um, and raised beds really they are um, they prevent the children from standing on them first of all as long as you don't make them too wide um, they are easy to just cover up and leave if for any reason you have to stop using them for a while so they're easily managed. Um, you can import that topsoil so you can use it on all sorts of ground. You don't need to worry about digging down. Um, and uh, it demarks a, a really nice separate area for different activities as well. Makes crop rotation easy, all sorts of things um, that can really, really help um, children uh, and teachers as well. Next slide, please. Oops. Thank you. So that's another angle of that. And they added a potting shed over there as well, netted it to keep the pigeons off um, and just extended it as and when they wanted to. So they added things as they felt more confident uh, and as they got more classes and more children involved. Um, so that's always something to think about when you're working with schools as well. Thank you. Next one, please. And then this is a wildlife garden at another school. Um, this is a school I worked with um, after they put these amazing things in. Um, they had the most wonderful grounds. Um, and um, so they demarked um, a, a separate area entirely for wildlife. Um, and they had another growing area and an orchard and, and cob houses. But this was just as to show that you can do lots of different sorts of gardening in schools. It doesn't necessarily have to be just veg growing and shouldn't be. Um, and you can sort of demark areas there uh, so that anybody who wants to do um, 
wildlife work can go to that area um, and separate classes and separate groups can come out at different times as well. Thank you, next one please. And then this was an African bag garden project, the sorry end of the season, um, with a school that didn't really have much growing space at all. Um, and they linked it to sort of um, global um, issues they were looking at um, and um, different cultures and all sorts of things. Uh, and that was a really, really fun thing for them to do as well. Uh, and the next slide. And then there's another example as well, potting shed, raised beds, fenced area, um, paths clearly marked as well. Um, and then they've got all sorts of things growing all over the place, as you can see. Um, they've got cock pop bins um, and so on, and it's nice and ordered and beautiful. Um, a nice combination of flowers and, and crops and things going on in the background as well. Um, I've got a lot of that palette fencing off over the years, and it's really, really useful. Uh, next slide, please. And then this one was a um, parent-led project actually in the school and all of those planters were on wheels so that they could move them around the playground as and when. Very expensive setup, but they did make the most of it. Parents had fundraised for it. They had lots of different um, sort of growing beds and things. And you can go all out with those. So you can, you can make things out of old pallet wood. You can use old sleepers. You can just dig down into the ground, do lasagna beds and all sorts. But um, if you do have some fundraising parents or committees or anything around, there's some amazing things out there. There's beds with um, portholes in so you can see root systems. There's all sorts of amazing things. Um, and it's well worth doing some of those as well. Or creating them yourself too. Thank you. Next, next slide, please. Okay, I think it's me now. Um, so just thinking a bit about how to approach a school, and um, I'm not sure maybe a, a number of you are already working with schools, um, but just a few things to think about. Um, it is worth having a very clear idea of what you feel your organization could offer the school um, and what sort of outcomes you could help the school achieve. Schools are incredibly busy. They have really busy timetables. Um, but if you can help them in some way, then that's really going to be useful to them and, and something they'd be interested in talking to you about. Um, they can obviously get really overwhelmed with all the things that they have to do to meet, you know, sort of government requirements and, and school requirements. Um, so just think about how how you might be able to be an organization that could actually help them. Um, and obviously use your contacts. Um, you need to try and find the right person to talk to um, in the first place. And that usually would be somebody like the head teacher or possibly the caretaker at the school or a really dedicated um, teacher. Um, but and you know that think about who that might be or it might be a number of those people talk to them maybe get them to give come and see what you do as well if they're willing to come out to you um and then hopefully once you've worked with one school then you can start working with lots of schools because they'll talk about what a great um opportunity you're giving them um, and you can certainly use social media and websites and parents as well. Um, so there are various people you're going to want to communicate with. Um, obviously, you're going to be communicating with the staff um, and getting on the school's agenda if you can um, and doing that through emails and meetings. Meetings are probably the best way because that's a much more approachable way of talking to people. Um, so if you can contact them directly rather than just send them sort of an obscure email, because they do get a lot of um, communication that way, um, make it a bit more personable um, and offer to help them with the planning. Um, there, there might be people there that are really keen, but don't know very much about growing. And that's where you come in because you will. Um, and Get, as I say, come and get them to see what you're doing because they may never have been over to see a, any kind of community garden or farm situation. Um, and if you've got something really exciting, that will get them enthused and you can then talk about what could be, happen on their site. Um, and then you do need to report regularly the head teacher and the senior leaders because they're going to want to know, they they have to report to their governors or their boards. Um, and and uh, so 
if you can show them what's happening and what progress you're making, that's going to be really important to, to people that are in the senior sort of leadership or head teacher situation. Um, you communicating with parents is really good too because they're often really really enthusiastic that's you know the kinds of things that you do are the kinds of things they'd like to see their own children doing at their school um so you you might go to some sort of parent teacher forum or association and um ask to speak to them and keep them updated you could be part of um, newsletters or websites or any kind of social media that they're running um sending things home is always good so if you're if you're running sessions if you're actually got in there already um things like um seed seedlings or seeds even home um that's going to be of interest to parents and that sort of brings what you're doing at school back home again um you can certainly ask for donations of all kinds of equipment and seeds and and often keen parents have got things that you that would be really useful to you either at your own site or at the school um so that's definitely worth thinking about and doing um and certainly there are some parents that are just really really keen horticulturists themselves so they want to see if they can help out you can create family activities um and there, there's a few suggestions here there's all sorts of things you can do with open days seed swaps who's gonna you know everybody grows the biggest sunflower um if you have chickens you could be selling things like eggs to families um so there's there's so many different opportunities there um and um a good idea is to maybe display some of the things you're doing where parents are picking up children now i appreciate with covid and um social distancing you have to think carefully about that and you definitely have to get um permission to do that from the school but it's worth thinking about how you can maybe sort of almost advertise yourself and the things you're doing um, as people are coming to to pick up or drop off their children right so we're back to you Katie <laughs> <laughs> um yes so um working within term time is the one of the biggest challenges actually if you're working with a school because you're um, and this is a challenge that schools have as well when they're gardening on their own, they plant lots of things and then everything is harvestable in, um, in the summer holidays. So nobody gets the benefits of that. Um, so we've got, uh, I've, there's an example plan there for, for how I might um, sort of what I might do through those different half terms um, and I've got um, several plans where I you know I'm working looking at planting things at slightly different times using different um, parts of the plants different varieties and so on so my the top tips really are get some protected cultivation so that you can manipulate extend the growing season um, more um, use succession sowing a lot um, and I always advise that they they plant you know several sowings of the same thing just to ensure that they can keep those harvest um times um going um choosing the right varieties is really important as well um so uh making sure that you know you've got um your your choice of um what sort of tomato, whether you're going for cordon or bush, whether you're going for baby veg, whether you're going for um, carrots that will overwinter in storage and so on. Um, having to think about that and when you want uh, those activities to happen as well is really, really important. So some schools want a big event where they celebrate all their gardening, um, pizza gardens where they grow everything for a pizza and all cook it together. Um, are really um, popular, things like that. So you just work from when do they want that event to happen um, and, and work your sewing um, times back from that um, as much as you can. Um, and then others want lots of classes to come over over several weeks uh, and all sort of pretty much do the same thing, you know, uh, plant something, harvest something. Um, and so then you're looking at sort of um, making sure that those harvest times are extended um, over several weeks and so on. Um, so little tricks as well, like planting a load of peas just before you leave for the summer holiday so that they're ready when you come back in September, um, as long as there's somebody there to water it and so on, um, really work well. Um, and there's lots of guidance we've got on, on that sort of thing as well. 
Um, other options for sort of speeding up and slowing things down and, and other activities, taking cuttings, sort of softwood cuttings around now you can do, um, and hardwood ones uh, other times of the year. Um, making sure that things are in the right location at the right spacing, because obviously that has an impact on how fast or slow they grow as well. Um, choosing some overwinter crops is always good. So thinking about things that children can come back to um, after holidays in winter and so on. Doing some seed saving, planting things that will actually broadcast seed and pop up next. You've got that sort of uh, set up there as well. And then looking at wildlife and conservation projects alongside. There's lots and lots of resources out there. Um, uh, the Get Your Hands Dirty Pack works really, really well for helping guide you through the first few things. Um, uh, and there's loads of things that you can do throughout uh, term time. Uh, but it's just those little adjustments that will help you get sort of harvesting um, right um, and not have a glut right through the summer holidays um, uh, when the children don't get the um, benefit really. Uh, right, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so that is. Um, just an example of children collecting molehills to fill up their raised beds there. Um, and um, we thought about sort of working with the curriculum as well. Um, and um, you can offer both academic and sort of therapeutic outcomes through gardening, which I'm sure you all know. Um, start by looking at the age range, the sort of key stage that you want to work with um, and talk to curriculum leaders and subject leaders about that. What are those outcomes? Uh, they'll have curriculum plans, they'll have schemes of work, um, they'll have loads of guidance there, which are a great place to start. Um, they won't have time to rewrite schemes of work around um, the garden, uh, but they will love it. Right, well, see this lesson here, this learning outcome, we can do that through gardening with no extra work to you, we can just pop out and do something around that. And there'll be plenty of things where you can link the curriculum directly uh, to the garden um, and the other one is of course um, sort of more therapeutic and well-being ones as well. Um, next slide please. Thank you so yeah so the well-being side of it just to talk about that a little more. Um, the, um, the outdoor learning hubs there were um, are quite useful so we just converted a greenhouse that we didn't need for growing at the time into the cultivation station they had an inspiration station in uh, the art section of the school library so we did an equivalent one outside and it meant that all the resources that any member of staff needed um, could, they could go out and grab them um, and you could do it in pack form as well so you'd have little boxes of everything they need to go out and do a little bit of gardening there too um, and that was for some academic things although um, obviously those need specific resources for lessons sometimes but sort of uh, for well-being as well so they could just go out and grab something do an activity out there um, well-being is always a topic in schools before the pandemic and it's even more needed now um, and there's lots of initiatives that Garden and Farm are just perfect for for delivering those well-being outcomes. Um, a lot of schools will already be undergoing things like Thrive and Nurture projects in their school um, um, and now with children back after this long lockdown a lot of them are focusing on recovery timetables um, and they're focused on getting their pupils ready to learn again after all this disruption, Zoom online lessons, um, learning from home um, uh, and so on. So they're having to revisit some of their learning outcomes, they're having to get their children, especially the younger ones, uh, used to being in a classroom again, used to being um, taught in that way. Um, and they're also addressing all the issues caused by lockdown. So, you know, isolation, loss um, and so on. Um, so wellbeing is really, really high up there on the agenda for schools at the moment. And I think us uh, going in there and doing uh, sort of growing um, activities is just so vital, it really is. Children can't begin to access catching up on all that academic learning until they feel safe and happy to be back at school and gardening is a brilliant way to do that um, and um, that's it's really important that we do that right now as well um, and next slide please right this is me 
Um, so just moving along a bit, um, if you're thinking of working with schools, um, you need to you need to think about what you might charge um, because schools do have budgets um, and they if they know ahead of time, they can build you into their budget. Um, but you need to be clear that you understand what your costs are and that you're really clear to the school about what it is you're going to provide. Um, are you going to be coming into the school with a whole bunch of your staff and volunteers? Are you going to have them come over to your site? So you need to think about what how that looks. Um, again, you need to think about how it's going to tie into the curriculum and support the school, going back to that sort of original theme that I was talking about earlier. If you do decide that you're going to be doing work with schools, it is worth having some sort of contract or memorandum of understanding that you set up ahead of time um, so that you're really clear about what what's going to happen and what they're going to do how many staff are they going to bring to your site for instance how many children so that you don't have far too many children and not enough adults um, so all the things that need to be worked out ahead of time should be put down on paper and and have a some sort of clear agreement between you and the school um, so that you know what what where you are um, and then also you might you might if you're pricing the work if you're doing something regularly and you can see that you're going to have regular work with them and it's going to go on for a year or whatever that is going to influence how much you charge versus doing a one-off event um, if you're just doing a one-off thing that might that might carry a, a slightly higher charge i would say uh, if you're doing something regularly and you've got a regular setup then um, you're probably going to look at it over the course of a longer period of time and what that looks like. So there's lots of things to consider and it's worth considering them early on rather than, oh boy, I'm going to be doing all this work. I have no idea what to charge. <laughs> um, but do come back to us if, if you're struggling with that because we may be able to help you. Um, and obviously you need to be creative with what you've got. Um, I love this picture. Keely, you probably know this picture better than me, but they're <laughs> using the goats. <laughs> it was a goat Pilates session. On goat there. Pilates and the goats are <laughs> taking part as well. So this obviously is a school with goats, which is nice, but um, yeah, it's amazing that you can, you know, that there's probably plenty of things that you've got that schools would want and vice versa. And you can, you can really get creative with what, what you do and how you use it. Um, so there are various challenges um, and, you know, historically doing things outdoors has not really been in, well, it's got more and more popular, but I think now we have a massive opportunity with COVID. People are thinking, wow, we really need to think differently about how we work in schools um, and all the benefits there are of, of working outside, working with nature, looking at food growing, looking at working with animals and, and all the well-being things that um, Keely mentioned as well. Um, and we are, you know, as Keely also said, we, we're we're coming out of this pandemic, hopefully, and there are going to be a lot of fairly traumatized children. So using the outdoors and using nature um, and growing is, is something I think a lot more schools are going to be really, really interested in. Um, so hence, <laughs> we came up with the Growing Teachers course, which um, we started for the first time in February. Um, and Keely is our primary teacher. I, I'm there to sort of assist and, and add where I can. Um, and we cover a really wide range of things um, in the course. It, it, at the moment, we're running it as a 10 week course online for two hours a week from four o'clock to six o'clock. So we have a, a session this afternoon, later today. Um, but we're planning to do this again in um, the autumn probably September time. So we'll be taking applications again towards the end of the, the uh, well, beginning of the summer, shall I say, maybe end of June time. Um, and it, the course is for anyone who is either working at a school and might be a teacher and wants to set up a garden or a farm or is already doing that and wants to do more, or it could be for um, members uh, who are community gardens or city farms who want to be working with schools. Um, so it's, it's just looking at the sort of two sides of that. And the course at the moment is made up almost, well, almost 50-50, I think, of, of, of those two 
kinds of groups, the schools themselves, so community gardens and some farms as well that are that are keen to work with children. Um, and what do we cover? We cover absolutely. <laughs> I don't know what have we covered so far Kaylee we've done um, term time growing and working with the curriculum and working with staff and parents um, in the last two sessions you've done small animals we're doing livestock today um, yeah and then we've got some more on sort of different growing methods um, uh, and, and advanced growing there um, as well um, and then funding and opportunities and resilience of your project and so on and evaluation, I think that's another one. Yeah. 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 So we try and cover everything that you could possibly think of um, in terms of from both ends, really, whether you are, as Heidi says, a teacher in school running a project or you're a community garden or a um, project that wants uh, to go into schools or reach out to schools and get them out to you as well to do some gardening. Yeah. Uh, either way. Definitely. And so it currently costs £199 for 10 weeks and you get lots of resources as well. Um, plus you meet a fantastic bunch. We tend to take about 25 people at a time. And so they become a, their own sort of network in a way, um, which is quite good. Um, uh, and yeah, that's probably all I need to say about the course at the moment, except that it has proved very popular and we will continue to teach it. Um, we may we have just discussed the possibility of doing a combination of online and face to face in September because obviously it is nice if people could see each other um, more up close and personal. <laughs> um, but but there are a lot of advantages to doing online as well. So we may do a combination of that. But so watch that space. And if you're interested, please get in touch with us and let us know. Mm -hmm. And I think that sort of gets us to the end. I don't know, Alison, if you want to just say anything about the Social Farms and Gardens group Facebook page. Yeah, um, well, I'll, I'll come to that probably at the end, if that's OK. okay. So yeah, we'll, we'll do some questions here and now. Uh, thanks okay, ever so much, both of you. Um, and um, and we'll um, let some people ask here. But it, yeah, like Heidi mentioned there, if you do have any questions later on, we've got our Facebook group, which is really active. Um, mm -hmm. So a great place to speak to other community gardens or other teachers who are working um, with schools um, and kind of raise any questions there and sometimes Heidi Keely and I jump in on there as well and we might be able to offer some assistance too um but um, just a couple of questions that have come up so far if anyone else has a question please pop it in the chat um or raise your hand um so Stuart just asked about legal entities I know Heidi's answer is going to be be one <laughs> um but um I want to ask are there any kind of preferred legal entities that in your experience schools tend to like to work with over others I would say schools are not as bothered about legal entities as people like the lottery and funders and local authorities are so it might be the local authority cares and then the school cares because of that but generally speaking no I don't think they're going to be too what's worried Keely may have a different view I don't know but well, what's important to them is there's, there's um, the DBS checks and, and yeah. the safeguarding uh, yeah. training and so on so that's what they're interested in um, they may if you are a community volunteer group they may treat you as a, a volunteer coming into schools which lots of people do and they'll do their own DBS check on you um, and, and supervise you in that way um, or if you are a company with a service level agreement or a more, more sort of formal agreement with them and you're coming out to them, they will have um, sort of strict checks on what they have to check for. I've just redone all our paperwork um, for the schools that come to us um, so that we don't get lots and lots of questions from schools. Um, in Worcestershire, where I'm based, um, an outdoor alternative provision was closed down by Ofsted because they hadn't done something around um, they couldn't prove that their safeguarding and so on was up to scratch and it was purely an admin thing um, and they came down quite hard on them so we all got together and had a bit of a meeting and thought right what are we going to all of the the outdoor provisions in the county sort of thing quite a few of us got together um, had a look at our service level agreements put those things in place made sure our staff were trained there's lots of safeguarding training online and so on um, and just we were able to tick all the boxes for the schools um, and for Ofsted if, they, if, the, if schools are inspected 
Ofsted will possibly come out to you as well if you have schools visit you um, to have a look at what where the schools are sending uh, their children on um, trips and, and outdoor provision and so on. So if you do offer that sort of service where the same children come regularly, it, it's definitely worth being up to scratch with that. Absolutely. Um, so that's what schools are more interested in. Yeah, and if you go in safeguarding is the big one far more yeah. than what legal entity you are. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously your insurance isn't there. Mm -hmm. Um, that leads on to a question that I had around um, that kind of introduction that you're making to the school and your pitch that you're making to them. Um, you've mentioned there about safeguarding is really important. We talked about well-being earlier. What are the kind of buzzwords that m will hit the spot with uh, schools in your experience? Oh, gosh. Right. OK. Um, so be careful if you do decide to go in and offer something for free if you don't intend to continue with that. Um, because schools have a real issue with paying for something they've had for nothing in the past. Yeah, <laughs> which is why I would definitely not do it for free if you can avoid it. Um, yeah. um, that's probably you not what you want to hear, Kaylee, but <laughs> generally <laughs> speaking. And who can, yeah. absolutely. Um, and, um, and, and offering sort of offering to um, train staff and empower staff as much uh, as possible as well. Um, so empowering them to, to do stuff uh, with you is great. Um, say that you will offer training to, to teachers or a little bit of, um, you know, give a talk on a, a teacher training day or something like that um, is, is a really good way in as well uh, and getting staff enthused that way. Um, and also, they love a report, so they love things written down. So even if you're having those softer outcomes of well-being, it hasn't happened if they haven't got it written down in a report somewhere. So offer to do a quick, you know, termly or something report of how many children you've had through the door, um, who you've worked with, get some pupil voice is another really great one. So get some sort of anecdotes, um, get some um, comments from anybody who's had, it's had an impact. So staff, parents, children, um, and write those down and send it off to the head teacher every so often. Um, and that will do you the world of good if you offer that. Um, so it's a really good one. And it won't take you long to do a quick report here and there just to say what the impact is. Um, and the more sort of children you can work with, they can divide it cost per head then and it, it looks better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. I'm just responding in the chat to, uh, I think it's Lou's question about whether CICs prefer, um, whether local authorities prefer CICs, just to say that what's really important is that you are a legal entity. So local authorities are worried about risk. Um, if you can prove that you're a, you're a valid organisation that's registered with Companies House or the Charity Commission, then that just reduces the risk that they're taking by engaging with you so that's the thing it's also less risk for you as well as as individuals if you're um a company or a cic then you've got limited liability for yourselves if something goes wrong if there's a safeguarding issue or something like that you you obviously still need to have all your procedures and do everything properly in place but there's a little bit of fallback for you if everything does go wrong or if the school won't pay or anything like that so we'd always recommend recommend becoming a company limited by guarantee it's nice and easy to do um or a or a community interest company as well um okay. any yeah any other questions there i feel like it did cover a lot of stuff if anyone wants to raise a question themselves you're very welcome to just um if you pop your hand up i should be able to see you Ah, Lou, lovely. Yeah, unmute yourself and you can raise a question with us. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so, um, I know you kindly offered to um, uh, help us out with charging uh, sort of outside this. I just wondered whether you had any um, sort of leads on that. I mean, there are, if you've got volunteers, um, there are obvious costs like... Um, you know seeds and the stuff you need to actually grow during the year but um and i can see i was a governor for a, in a city school in sheffield for a while and um i know that some some alternative um, alternative provision providers charge what i consider to be quite extortionate amounts um but also i can see that it 
offering things for free um yeah could could have its downsides so i just wondered whether you had any broad um comments on charging and pricing um well i guess where i'd start is i'd look at what what all the costs are and there are some that might even be sort of hidden costs so do you need to be insured and and or uh and are you bringing equipment that they don't have um and do you need to pay so many staff to come along not just volunteers you may have volunteers that's great but there are usually costs out there that that um so you really do need to think about like what is this activity i'm going to do what are all the things that i'm going to have to cover um and then and yeah and i think also the problem is when you just offer things for free you suddenly look more amateur mm -hmm. um and less sort of i don't know I'm sure it sounds good on paper to say it's all for free, but um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'd start by looking, you know, almost put together a shopping list of all the things that you know it's going to cost. And then and then I would maybe come up with an hourly charge if you're just going to be there for a couple hours and think about what, what a reasonable hourly charge is, yeah. which, you know, might be sort of 30 pounds an hour or something like that um, as a rough... Or the group. Stop. Yeah. But I mean, if you're going to be taking on like a whole school activity with 200 children, that is a lot more money than just like 30 children in one class. So think about that, too. And also think about like, do you have to bring a lot more adults with you or are they going to have a bunch of staff there already to cover that? that these are things I think you need to. I don't know, Keely, if you've got other thoughts but... absolutely yeah don't have 200 children at once no <laughs> don't have 30 children at once um have a look at obviously with the age range uh, and the and any additional needs it changes the staffing ratio so you've got to be clear with schools whether they're expecting you to manage behavior you shouldn't be uh, or they're sending the right amount of staff along if they are coming out to you if you're going into the school um there should be a clear expectation of which staff they leave with you and how many children are working with at any one point and don't sort of overestimate because uh, it obviously the younger they are the more like herding cats it is so um just be sort of realistic about that do absolutely copy your costs completely um we've got um sort of half day and full day rates um which obviously um get a, a discounted rate for that and not during COVID, but normally we do a discounted rate if a school wants to bring five children along, um, up to five. We charge a standard rate and say it's up to five, um, yeah. because otherwise they tend to sort of mess you about a little bit in terms of, oh, well, I'm only bringing one now, so I'm only going to pay for one. No, because the staff allocation and the resources are the same, really. So think in terms of, of being clear with that, definitely. And do have a look at what other people similarly are charging around um, yeah. for, for similar things. It will be different. And I mean, if you're in London, it'll be more <laughs> probably or in a city. Um, yeah. and, it, and also who your competition is, because if there are other people and there will be, you know, there'll be other organizations offering things to schools. So you need to find out what they're what they're charging. Yeah. And be clear about that. Uh, but all of that will be on your service level agreement if you do one anyway. Um, and, and in an answer to whether there's any specific government funding or, or um, Department of Education funding, not that I know of, um, if you go to schools and say, well, you've got pupil premium, you need to be spending this on these children, then that will ring, you know, some bells for them. That's fine. Um, um, and schools are now uh, mainstream, particularly, um, have got sort of COVID recovery funding. So they've got someone, some more funding to play with around these things um so it's a great time to go in and say you know i can deliver these things for you definitely i mean schools can go for for lottery funding as well they can go for things like awards for all um they could apply for that um and cover their cost you know it could be they're doing all sorts of things with you um and they're applying for funding that would cover cover some of the activities you might provide yeah and it might be that you work collaboratively with the school to put in a funding bid somewhere. Yeah, definitely. yeah that's a good idea as well. Yeah, as I say, there are groups that are doing that. Um, so they might identify the school and say, well, we can put in an awards for all bid 
for you you pay us from it <laughs> um and, and we'll we'll be able to do that and then the school's really happy because they don't have to do any, do any work and they don't have to pay for anything but it's that open acknowledgement or that overtness that there is a fund a, a, attached to it that it is costing them something and um, but that money's being sought from elsewhere yeah brilliant thank you you're welcome any final questions otherwise we might all finish up earlier we've been so efficient <laughs> i will send out all the bits and pieces afterwards so i'll send a copy of the um slides to everyone um and this recording will be up on our youtube channel soon it might actually be early next week when it comes out to you um but uh, we'll, we'll get it out to you as soon as possible okay If you do think of anything afterwards, obviously you can just get in touch with um, myself or Heidi probably. So um, I think you probably got my email address when we set up the meeting. Heidi's is very similar. It just says <laughs> Heidi at the beginning rather than Alison, surprisingly. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, do feel free to get in touch with them. And remember that the next Growing Teachers course is kicking off in uh, the autumn. So nice busy time for teachers and schools. Um, <laughs> But the registration will be open soon, so that will be announced on our social media, um, and you'll be able to access that through the website. Yeah, we'll we'll try. We'll probably start taking applications the end of June. Is what we're looking at. What I would say, I will just say a few things about that. A, we were really, really oversubscribed for the very first course, so we expect to be again. Um, and we will be giving priority to members. Um, so if you aren't a member, um, then become one because it's free. Um, but that, you know, that when we look at the applications, we will be sort of giving the, the members a priority over that. So. Right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Keely. Thank you, Heidi. Thanks to everyone for participating. And I uh, wish you a very happy afternoon and good luck with growing teachers this afternoon, ladies. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.